Welcome to the Republican Professor. Today, this afternoon for John, but this morning for me in California, we have Dr. John Basie. Did I say your last name right? You did. I know. I, I half the time I forget to ask. Do am I going to say this wrong or right? But I'm glad I did. Dr. John Basie is joining us from your work in on the East Coast. I know you're on Eastern Time. Pine Mountain, Georgia. Pine Mountain, Georgia. Is there actually a mountain there with pines on it? Some would say not. It's it's really. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Colorado, like, so you know. Yeah, it's not. It's not like those. It's really okay. a, a a glorified um, hill. A glorified hill. Does it have at least one pine tree on it? It's got many pine trees. Okay, I was going to say. Otherwise, this is this whole city is a lie. And we need to. <laughs> no, it's there are it's tons like, of pines. It's like Thousand Oaks. I, I mean, I one time I counted the oaks. There's only 997 of them. <laughs> so I, you know, I I just cannot, in good conscience, drive through that city anymore. Well, it's good having you on, John. Um, it's great. What to be do here. You, what do you do in Pine Mountain, Georgia? I am. I, I hold a couple of roles. Uh, my, my full-time work is at a place called Impact 360 Institute. We are uh, an educational organization. A simple way of, of describing it would be uh, residential higher education done differently. And what I mean by that is we have uh, two main residential programs, both of which are credit bearing. One is a nine month credit bearing gap year for recent high school graduates. Uh, the emphases are biblical worldview, leadership, and God's calling. Our no be and live uh, holistic discipleship model, which we could get into a little later. And that's accredited? It, 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 it is. Our, our academic partner is Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. Oh, yes. And uh, you may know Hunter Baker, who, who I don't know there. him personally. I, he wouldn't know me. I know I know that he works there. Yes. The yes. only fact about him that I know. Sure. Uh, great, great brother. Great colleague. Great first name. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, and so, yeah, it's accredited, accredited coursework, 18 hours. And then our master's program is a full two year residential master's degree in leadership, which does include coursework in Christian worldview and ethics. And one of the unique things about this particular Master of Arts in Leadership degree is our, if our students get into the program, they're automatically granted a paid graduate assistantship working with the younger students discipling them, even working as TAs, grading their papers, uh, coming alongside them as mentors in various capacities. Uh, so we partner with North Greenville University in South Carolina for that program, uh, both of whom fully SAC COC accredited. Tell us what COC is. Uh, Commission on Colleges. And SAC is Southern Association. Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Mm -hmm. And that, so, that, that's important that he said that for everybody listening is that John, John mentioned um, it's a regional accreditation agency, which is, it, it, it's a little counterintuitive for people to understand, but the, the national accrediting is actually less impressive than regional accrediting. Right. So... Um, all your big time classically known schools like Harvard will be regionally accredited. The course, the places out here in California are regionally accredited. Right. Right. So that, that's a big deal. So in other words, it's legit. That's right. <laughs> it's legit. That's right. Okay. Regionally that's accredited. Exactly I'm right. glad you said that. So if, if you have, if any of your listeners have high schoolers that may be thinking about doing something a little bit differently versus the traditional move on straight to a four-year program 
following high school, they want to take a look at their at our uh, gap year program. Uh, you can jump on impact360.org and find out all about that program. It's called the Fellows Program. Uh, 360, does it impact360.org? That's right. That's right. And, and 360 is spelled out in the numbers or in the letters? That's right. Yeah. Impact360.org. Gotcha. We'll link that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell us how you got involved with that. Yeah, I was working as an administrator as well as professor at Columbia International University back in 2005. That's in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And we've had we've had a person on this um, podcast that teaches there. Oh, fantastic. John Rebusman. He he has sure. the philosophy department. Yeah, yeah, I know him. I've, I've met him a time or two. Great guy. Yeah, he did our episode on trust and epistemology. Great, great super, discussion. Super. Yeah. So, so I was, I was there from 2003 to 2006 and doing teaching, doing uh, administrative work. Uh, I led the admissions area and, and recruitment, uh, financial aid as well. And I was trying to finish my PhD. I'd finished all the coursework. I was in that stretch that you would know about very well. Yeah. Uh, ABD land, or I thought it was going to be uh, that. I thought I was going to be a, a, a casualty. By God's oh. grace, I wasn't. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. What? How long did you stay in ABD land? Yeah, it was, it was almost, let's see, from the time I finished my comps, it was five years. So comps are comprehensive exams and they're a big deal. These are not like your little exams for the sat or whatever this is like a written yeah multi-day usually was yours multi-day it was yeah it was it was four days mm -hmm. of four hours of peace of no, nothing of nothing but writing and i had to be ready to, to respond to almost any question that would have covered 120 books uh, spanning four different areas of competency. Uh, and so that just took a while in and of itself to get ready for. And then the dissertation took another five years. So I finally finished in 2010 and, uh, thanks be to God. Uh, but, uh, but how I came to be here was in 2005, there was a faculty member, uh, on the seminary, uh, side of things there at CIU, who was working as a consultant for uh, a family here in Georgia. And I'll tell you the family in just a moment, but. Um, it's not just some random family. It's not a random family. Okay. Your, your listeners will probably recognize, um, recognize them, but this seminary professor said, Hey, I'm, I'm working as a consultant for this group and, and they're wanting to, they're wanting to put together a, a worldview program, a worldview institute. They're not quite sure what they want it to be yet, but you should get interested in this thing. And I, I just didn't know what that meant. I, I was happy <laughs> doing what I did. I, I wanted yeah. to finish my PhD. We were enjoying Columbia. And he just kept on, he was kind of like, uh, you know, Jesus throwing out the parables, just kind of rattling uh, th those things rattling around in my mind. Uh, and I, I couldn't, couldn't let it go, even if I wanted to. And finally I said, okay, Mike, his name was Mike. Tell me more about this. Turns out that the family, uh, that was and is behind it is, uh, the, the Kathy family of Chick-fil-A and, um, who, who I, actually work for is John and Trudy Kathy White, Trudy being the daughter, the only daughter of Chick-fil-A founder Truett Kathy. And so back in back way back then they felt you work uh, you work for her? I, I do. I do. So Impact 360 Institute is its own nonprofit with a board. Uh, they sit on the board. They are they are co-founders of the institute. 
Um, so I work for the Institute, but insofar as they are co-founders and they sit on the board, I, I work for them. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's how I heard about it was through this consultant. And after that, it was pretty much history and came and we started in 06 and uh, we've been doing this ever since. I did have a brief period of about 15 months from 17 to 18 when I was called back to my own alma mater in South Carolina to serve as provost. And uh, that, that, was, that was a good experience in many ways. And I was uh, very glad to be welcomed back to the Institute. You finished your PhD in 2010? Correct. Okay, so reading between the lines here, <laughs> you began working for a Chick-fil-A sponsored um, <clears throat> nonprofit, educational nonprofit. Is that correct? We, we would right, right. That's in the 2006. Spirit. We we would say we would say they are uh, a, a a friendly a friendly affiliate. There's no, there's no formal connection between us and the company. It's important for me to point that out. So you can have a hamburger for lunch? Well, I, I'm no allowed one, to do no that. No alarm bells will go off. Uh, no, no. And in fact, this is a little known, little known fact. If you'll come to Georgia, uh, I'll treat you to a Chick-fil-A that actually serves red meat. Oh, you are blowing my mind here. This yes. is, I have to see this. Only in Georgia. Now, are you allowed to take photographs? Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. These these are called uh, these 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 are a, a version of the Chick Fil A stores that only exist in the Atlanta area. Whoa, you're blowing my mind. Are they called Chick Fil A? Uh, they are they called. Something? They are called Truitt's Chick Fil A. Okay, so it's not called Whataburger or anything like that. No. So they do offer the the legacy chicken sandwich, of course, but in addition to that, if you want to get something else on the side, they do have some red meat options. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's a fantastic. I've never heard of that. Thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So you were, my, where I was getting at is you started this full-time work in 2006 after being at Columbia for a while. That's right. And you were ABD and you were writing a dis researching and writing a dissertation and communicating with your committee members, obviously, because yes. that's who has to sign it. That's right. About you, you the quality and scope and content and, and craftsmanship of your dissertation. How long was that's your right. dissertation? If you include the bibliography, I think, uh, let's see, it's, it's, it's close to 300 pages. Yeah. Now, what did you write your dissertation on? I wrote it on the effects of the fundamentalist modernist controversy uh, in the 1900s on, on the concept and understanding at that time of what it meant to be a virtuous citizen. Oh, wow. Broadly. Now, if we narrow that down, I, I really get specific on wow. what aspect of that uh, and where I drill down specifically is on a particular institution founded by none other than uh, C.I. Schofield, uh, the editor of, uh, of course, the, the Schofield Bible. That's what he's best known. The Schofield Bible right up there on my bookshelf. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I was yeah. raised on the Schofield Bible, King James. Yeah, lots of people were. Lots yeah. of people were. Anti -intellectual, it was an anti-intellectual uh, church, though. Well, and this is part of what I get at in the dissertation is, is what, what so many Christians during the fundamentalist modernist controversy uh, considered to be virtuous citizenry was was heavenly citizenship only uh, without without much regard for what does yes. what does the cultural mandate in Genesis one mean 
yeah. for our work and citizenship right here. Now, of course, the modernists coming at it from the other angle, right? Yeah, right. Um, but that's that's what I wrote about. Was modernists? Uh, would you say would those were theological liberals? Is absolutely. That how you put them? Yeah, and by liberal we mean veering off the track of what we would consider the essentials of the Christian faith. Absolutely. Historical. Biblical inerrancy. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And once that goes, then you know what else starts to follow. That's right. All of a sudden, Mary wasn't really a virgin when she gave birth. And all of a sudden, the Trinity, what's that? And, That's right. And authority of scripture and That's sexual, right. real, sexual ethics, the definition of marriage, which Chick-fil-A has been in the news in some point in the past for their their opinion about what this the definition of marriage is right um, i thought i thought they were mistreated myself and a lot of people here in california were thought the same thing you know why i know that mm -hmm. it's because i was teaching on the college campuses in los angeles during that time and uh doing my own phd coursework and i was writing about the definition of marriage so i followed that very carefully in the arguments yes. and yes. um i saw the lines around the corner of the stores in in southern california of people yes. i mean i'd never seen lines like this ever in chick-fil-a right. and the, and the lines are really long in chick-fil-a anyway because you gotta <laughs> you only have six days you gotta <laughs> you know so uh, and I had lots of discussions with my students, uh, uh, clearing up misconceptions. In fact, there was a in Venice Beach, which is a, a, a part of Los Angeles that went for Hillary, probably about 80 percent or something like that in 2016. There is a uh, restaurant called Mao's Kitchen. And mm. my students, I, I mentioned this to my students and I, I Googled how many people did Mao kill? And I had it up on the screen, you know, experts disagree whether it's 45 million or 78 million, but both of those are pretty high numbers. And in, in my opinion, I mean, I can't count that high without taking off my shoes. That's how many people Mao killed. My students were so uncomfortable about this. And they said, well, how do we know it's the same Mao? Well, oh, my well. undergraduate is in Chinese. And I said, there's only one Mao. It's kind of like asking if it, you know, if it was Hitler's kitchen, how do we know it's the same Hitler? I mean, does that sound you as the kind of question you should be asking? Well, mm. if you have any doubt, if you walked in, there's a picture of Mao Zedong right over the cash register. And, and it, sa it says their theme is red memories, mm. which is communist. And there's all sorts of communist stuff if you know what you're looking for. Anyway, so I had this discussion at Pepperdine, actually. I taught there for over a decade. And uh, this is in 2017. And I, my students, I said, who are you bothered by? You're not bothered by Mao's Kitchen, but you're bothered by Chick-fil-A. And there was only a couple students. It was just the louder students. Mm -hmm. and, and they said, well, he discriminated the Chick-fil-A guy. And they didn't know his name. They just knew Chick-fil-A. And I, I said, I was just sensing a BS there. I was like, eh, I said, first of all, you're going to go to Chick-fil-A because I don't really believe that you believe what you're saying. But even then, what you mean is that they believe the definition of marriage is just what the dictionary says it is. I mean, it doesn't even have to be the Bible, but it's just the dick. And I looked up, I, I brought in a bunch of dictionaries, Oxford English Dictionary. There it was. It was right there on my MacBook Pro. In fact, I had it on MacBook Pro dictionary said a union between a man and a woman by which they become husband and wife, something like that. Secondary definition, any close union. For example, a, a marriage of a jazz, blues and pop gospel something like that anyway they couldn't believe the dictionary said that and i said in other words they're just expressing the english language and then you think that they're worse than mao zedong a brutal dictator who murdered tens of millions of people probably raped hundreds of women too by the way mm -hmm. 
there, there was utter shock and silence. I could not believe they had not heard that perspective at Pepperdine. I was, I was flabbergasted mm -hmm. that, that I, you know, they were, they were younger undergrads, but anyway, that was a live issue at the time. But even during that time, I saw the lines out the door and I was one of those people in those lines. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, what a wonderful PhD topic. <laughs> It, it was really interesting. How did you get that idea for that topic? Did you grow yeah. up in a fundamentalist church? No, I, I didn't uh, actually, but I've always been interested in higher education as a field of study. Uh, so yeah. much so that I strongly considered, uh, you and I both graduated from the same MA program in philosophy mm -hmm. uh, at at Biola, I, I strong yeah. in, in 99, when I finished, I strongly considered getting my PhD in higher education administration, just because I was so intrigued with, with higher ed itself and saw the importance of it. Mm. Uh, I didn't do that. I went to, instead, I went to Baylor and did an interdisciplinary degree in religion, politics, society, what, what was known at that time as church state studies. Mm -hmm. super interesting tackled all the areas i was interested in and was it, frank beckwith there at that time he i i preceded him by just a year or so so we we didn't okay. cross paths now we, we've interacted since then okay but yeah love that frank is is there still doing great work one uh, of our first guests on this podcast was a graduate a phd graduate of that that institute at baylor university in waco and he had Frank on his committee. Yes. That's why, that's why I asked. Yes, Frank. I love that Frank is there. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got in. I, I, Who was on your committee, if you don't mind my asking? Yeah, uh, Barry Hankins, uh, historian. Mm -hmm. uh, his specialty is American uh, evangelicalism. Uh, also, Mike Beatty, who is oh, yeah. chair of the philosophy department at Baylor. He's got a, a philo an educational philosophy book out somewhere. I think philosophy of education, I think. Another guy who was in the, the education department there, Perry Glanzer, was on my committee. He would be an excellent one to have on your podcast okay. uh, as I'll well. Um, How do you spell Perry, his last name? Yeah, G-L-A-N-Z-E-R. He's actually serving, I think, currently, he's, he, he's the editor-in-chief, I think, for Christian Scholars Review right now does a lot of work in the faith uh faith learning integration area okay and what what uh department is he in and at baylor i i think i think he is i think he teaches in their edd and phd programs in the school of education okay cool he himself is a graduate interestingly enough of the now closed down PhD in social ethics program out of USC. Oh. So yeah. he's a social social ethicist teaching in an education department. So he did he work with Dallas Willard? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I'd be sure. very interested to know if he did. Yeah. Because uh, I Dallas. think that's another the, yeah another thing here at, at Impact 360 Institute. Uh, Dallas Willard has had a very strong influence on what we do here in terms of spiritual formation, uh, in terms of how we think about faith learning integration, in terms of how we think about discipleship. Uh, J.P. Moreland has been a guest professor here almost every year since we started in 2006 there was a year or two where, when he had some some health issues but he's been with us from the beginning uh a number of we had him on of, the podcast uh in february right. yeah oh, good good um a number of talbot graduates have been hired here i'm one of them but there there are four others of us who are here right now um so Insofar as Dallas influenced that MA program, it's trickling down and having great effects here as well. Wow. 
What a, what a compliment to him. Yes. I'll look, I'll look up Perry Glanzer and I'll look him up. See, start a conversation with him. Yeah. He's really solid. Okay. Um, how in the world, this is a practical question for you. How in the world did you write that dissertation? <laughs> I mean, that sounds like I can't imagine grace. holding I, down a job and moving. yeah, you moved too, right? We moved. We, we didn't stay in Waco. I, I finished the coursework. The reason we moved is uh, we, we found out we were expecting our first child. And in the agreement, my wife and I, at that time, we'd been married for five years. We just said, all right, at whatever point we get pregnant, I'll start working full time and just keep on going with the school and Lord willing, I'll finish. And that's what we did. Well, at that time, you know, I was looking in the Waco area. I wanted to stay in the Waco area. Nothing was turning up in terms of a full-time job. And what year was job, that? Just to help us keep, what year was that? That was 2002. Okay. And the full-time job that was offered to me happened to be in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I, we left Waco and went to Washington, D.C. And I was working at that time for the Family Research Council. And uh, they had an undergraduate fellows program uh, at, at, that, at that time, a semester studies program. Uh, faith and politics, and I was helping to to run that program. So you were this? Did you say it was two thousand three, two thousand two? Yeah. Uh, I let's see. I, I left Waco in two thousand two to go to D.C. and was there for only about fourteen months. You left Waco because you had finished coursework, right? And because we needed a full time job finished coursework okay and worked for f focus on the family uh right? family research council and family research in, in dc uh is family research council affiliated with focus on the family there there is a connection uh jim dobson of course who was the founding president at focus uh, was on the founding board years ago at Family Research Council. Gotcha. Okay. And their uh, FRC, FRC for short, they're, they're doing some great work in, in terms of policy. and uh, They still exist? They do. They do. Ad, uh, conservative advocacy okay. uh, on the Hill. And their, their, their president, Tony Perkins, is, is a first-rate guy. Oh yeah, I remember. I th I seems like I remember there was some kind of attempted murder there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't call them a shooting because shooting is not an immoral activity in and of itself per se. Right. Because and and that's what the left tries to do when they take over language. They try to make a non more immoral activity immoral just by right. you know the word but you know you go to a shooting range there's lots of active shooting happening that that's not that's right. really uh, there's a good old-fashioned word called murder it's called <laughs> attempted murder yep. you know it goes all the way back to genesis 4 and uh exodus 20 anyway sorry i'm getting on my high horse here but uh yes i do remember that i remember uh being shocked about that being upset yes. about it yeah okay so you did, you were there for 14 months. And the reason I left so soon after, after getting there was, again, you would understand this, the need to finish the dissertation. Yeah. And I figured out that DC life as exciting as it was, I just could not finish. And did that's they, what did they pay you enough to live in DC. In, in that situation, it was doable because the position came with housing. Oh, Okay. Well, there you go. So we were okay in that regard. That's actually pretty smart of them to do yeah. that. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. People take note. Anybody founding these kind of 
organizations take note get some parsonages yes yeah we need to return to that that model yeah yeah absolutely got to think critically and creatively okay so what did you do after that this has been 2004 so in 2003 we landed at columbia international university oh, okay yeah okay yeah. So that uh, wasn't too far away. It wasn't as far as Waco to DC. Right. So, uh, and, and um, did you begin teaching at Columbia right away or did you start as an administrator there? And I started as an administrator full time oh. and their philosophy professor left uh, a semester or so after I had after I had gotten there mm -hmm. and the provost came to me and said, look, here's an opportunity. Could you pick mm -hmm. up this coursework? Uh, okay. We're in a bit of a bind and yeah. I was thrilled to do it. Uh, so I, I, I did that. I, I taught and, and did and administration. They, taught, they paid you the adjunct wage for that? Correct. Yep. Okay. And did you, were those classes during the day during the business they hours they were how did that work with your administrator duties did they just give you well, a, a time <laughs> off for that i i had to i had to finagle a few things and there were some evenings where i had to stay, stay late, late. To, gotcha yeah so it's flex time before. basically that's right i gotcha and then you're doing this how many classes did you teach as an adjunct philosophy professor per per week per uh per semester it was it let's see it was one course a semester so it wasn't a tremendous it wasn't an overload uh but with full-time full-time administration plus one course it was it was pretty heavy yeah how many students did you have mm -hmm. 25 20 there was, yeah, at the most at that time, it would have been about 20. And then one semester, it was as small as maybe 10. It was more like a seminar course. What kind of courses were you teaching? Was it intro? Logic? History, history of philosophy. Yeah, intro level history of philosophy. Is that course required there at Columbia? It was for, let's see, at the time that I was there, it was required for certain majors. Uh, a lot okay. of time has passed, but I don't, gotcha. I don't know what the case might be now. Okay. Uh, that's a lot of work. That's yes. a lot of work. Um, Plus trying and, to do dissertation. Yes. I don't know how you did it, man. Holy cow grace of god how far away did you live from the from the campus oh, it was only about 20 minutes or so okay so that wasn't terrible so you're not spending a whole lot of time commuting but no that's a lot um you somehow got through that and you left columbia remind us was that in 2006 2006 to come to Pine Mountain, Georgia, and you've been there ever since. Correct, correct. For all intents and purposes. So that's like 16 years of. Right. I did have that one span of time, very short, short amount of time that I left and came back. But. Uh, but how how long was that? You think? 15 months. I served as provost of of my own alma mater, Erskine College in South Carolina. And the Lord showed me through that experience, there were a lot of great things about it, uh, but, but my, my sweet spot where he wants to use me is right back here at the Institute. Did you move your family for that 15 months? I did. did you sell your home or anything like that? Totally. Yep. Oh man. Okay. You were, you were thinking I'm going to be back there. We, like, at the time we thought it was, we thought I would retire there. Yes. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. What did you major in in college? So I was a double school. major in psychology and Christian education. Oh, okay. How did you get interested in uh, in uh, philosophy? Yeah. Interesting story. 
I, it was my sophomore year in college and I had landed on the psychology major out of true interest, not, not out of mere pragmatism of just having to choose a major, mm -hmm. but I really was interested in the subject matter. I thought that the Lord at that time was calling me to become a licensed clinical psychologist and to do it for his glory. Uh, so I, I threw everything I had into that major. I mean, I was working as hard as a lot of the, a lot of the biology students who were pre-med. I was working as hard as they were uh, to make sure I could get into a doctoral program uh, for, for clinical psych. Well, that's, that's actually what took me to Biola was I went there to go to the, the PsyD program. No kidding. Wow. At the Rosemead School of Psychology. And uh, what I learned, this is fast forwarding a good bit. What I learned in my first semester at Rosemead is a, this is a noble profession and good people need to go into it. Christ mm -hmm. followers need to go into it. Yeah. B, I learned I'm not so interested in the practice of it. I'm, I'm more interested in the worldview assumptions underneath the discipline. Ah. And as soon as that clicked with me, I realized I've got to walk across campus and do the <laughs> MA Phil program. And you were aware of that program at that time? Well, interestingly enough, yes. In fact, part of what God was doing in my first semester at Rosemead was, uh, wooing me to that side of campus because at that time, and I don't know if it existed when you were there, but there was uh, an initiative through Talbot called TIBS, uh, Talbot Institute for Biblical Studies. They, they had lay courses done at local churches, and the one that I attended was E-Free, E-Free Fullerton, and it, JP had just published his book, Love Your God With All Your Mind. Oh, yeah. And that, that was the backbone text of that particular uh, lay course. Well, I looked forward to that course every week more than any of my mm. psychology courses, mm. uh, any of my doctoral level psychology courses. And as my wife wow. and I discussed it, we realized, you know, the Lord is just using this to help me realize, hey, he, he kind of wooed us out here to California from the East Coast mm -hmm. to do the philosophy program, not the psychology program. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool to see how all that worked out. It was, a, it, I experienced it as a bit of a loss, even though I was excited because yeah. all the work that had to go into getting into the doctoral yeah program yes. right the grades the references the internships yeah. the gre all um, that yeah and it is a doctorate and, and you're it is now a going from that to a, just a master's yeah exactly wow exactly that's a, lot. That's a big wow it was a leap of faith yeah that's a good good way not to put blind it. faith but it was a leap of faith hmm. uh but by his grace I, I was still was able to earn the doctorate and i see now it was it's the best thing I could have done. That's a really cool dissertation. It sounds like a great, I mean, it makes me want to read it actually. I'd be you glad could. to send you a PDF. Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Send it to me. Um, that's a great topic. I don't know if you ever finished telling us what your, how you got into that topic. Yeah, just interest in the subject of higher education itself, mm -hmm. and specifically Christian higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know this, having having taught for a long time, and keeping track of these things. How yeah. how higher education is is it's like plate tectonics right now, yep. and and it has been for a while. Yeah. And will we be able to maintain the core? of a truly Christ-centered higher education at the various institutions that claim to uh, hold Christ at the center. I saw uh, something in the news just today about an institution that I won't name that is dealing with um, 
in a big, big, big time way, uh, the same sex marriage issue. And uh, they're, they're trying to deal with it without really dealing with it. Uh, that's and not going to work. It, 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 it's not going to work. You got to deal with it head on. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I spent so much time thinking through those issues. I, 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 I just had an intuition that you have to get a handle on this right away. Yeah. That we, there's a lot of folks that seed the rhetorical ground and they really shouldn't do that. Like I well, never, I never put all my eggs in the first amendment basket. Sure. Because I think to some extent it sounds, well, first of all, there are people that, that believe that marriage is a unique thing. Um, I don't put an adjective in front of the word marriage. I, I just think it's, it's a sui generis thing. It, it's, you, you know, people know what it is and they, they're not necessarily Christian or Jew or, right. or anything like that. You could be an atheist and sure. know that. Um, and um, it's, it's an interesting topic to get into, but, but. Um, Something you just said, I think is really important. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad this, this triggered something in my mind here. Uh, you said seeding rhetorical ground mm -hmm. and something that I find even in students who truly are themselves authentic Christians, mm -hmm. Gen Zers. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gen Those Zers. are the lowest age wise bracket. Yeah. That are coming uh, born between 1999 and 2015. They have in my humble opinion, I, it's more than opinion, it's based on my experience in the classroom and elsewhere. They have the hardest time with the cultural mandate, fill and subdue the earth. Hmm. Now, they don't have a hard time thinking about it in terms of uh, agrarian references, right? Or even when I say, well, it goes beyond that to city building subdue the earth, build cities for God's glory. The ark of scripture starts in a garden, ends in the new Jerusalem garden to the city. Okay. That's great. All good stuff. But in the middle of all that, what kind of, what kind of design are we discovering that is imprinted on social order? Mm -hmm. Not that we just create with social contract, right? but what are we discovering namely marriage. And if it turns out to be the case that, uh, say in 2015, the, the, the fallout from the Obergefell decision has a bunch of Gen Zers believing that marriage is nothing more than say Christian social contract. And I ask the question, right. okay, what does it mean to take back cultural ground? They're horrified, some of them. Well, what do you mean take back ground? Isn't that <laughs> oppressive? Well, no, because God gave us ground to cultivate. And at times he asks us to take ground back that's been lost. Mm. And I would love to know who else is, is, is talking about the struggle in this way. Yeah. I know you are. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it, what's fascinating to me about that insight about the Gen Zers is they're missing the uh, the way it got to be the way they experience it, which is there was a side of that that won ground. Yes, and they think, oh, this is the way it's always been. No, right. it's not the way it's always been. In not fact, the, the opposite. It's always been the other way. And only recently has there been um, uh, some, I would say, minor, relatively minor victories on the other side. And I say minor because if they were truly well-grounded arguments, they would be major victories for them. But they're minor victories because they're not well-grounded arguments. Right. Right. And just like in the Roe versus Wade decision, which was seven to three, by, or sorry, let me get my math right, seven to two. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
there have been more than nine on the court at various points. <laughs> the uh, the uh, Supreme Court got it wrong. They yeah. they had a really bad argument, yeah, for for their decision, and it was Republicans too. You have to say, I mean, it was a Nixon appointee. It was also a Nixon appointee in the dissent, Ron, uh, Rehnquist, uh, yeah. and then a JFK uh, di- uh, appointee in the dissent. Byron White, um, Democrat, but so back in that day, Democrats and Republicans were equally uh, representing the dissent of Roe versus Wade. But the Ro- the Roe decision is not defended on its merits in scholarship, and that's because, and it never has been. From the very beginning, it was it was criticized by liberals and by Democrats, not only Republicans and conservatives. And that's because it's indefensible. <laughs> there, there's yeah. nothing in there that is redeeming at all besides the conclusion for them. And I don't even think the conclusion is redeemable. Uh, so the premises don't support the conclusion. Uh, it commits fallacies. And the, and the Obergefell decision in 2015 also suffers from fallacious reasoning i think it suffers from the fallacy of equivocation textbook Mm -hmm. fallacy of equivocation i i mentioned earlier there are two definitions of marriage in the dictionary in 2015. now those those two were the definition involving a man and a woman as necessary conditions and then any close union and what obergefell did justice kennedy bless his heart he got it right on the guns he was right on the gun decisions, um, but he um, he just equivocated on those two senses of the same spelling of marriage, and um, and then the other one is begging the question, yeah, because you have to ask what marriage is. You have to define it. The decision nowhere defines the term. Yeah. So if you're going to say this term defined this way is wrong, you have to supply the new definition. That's just how it works. That's right. And uh, when it was struck down in California, Proposition 8, which was a uh, first it was Prop 22, which was struck down uh, by NRA marriage cases, which is a state decision in 2008. And then Prop 8 got on the ballot in 2008. Then that was uh, Perry versus Schwarzenegger, which is a federal court decision in San Francisco, um, which struck down Prop 8 as unconstitutional. <laughs> well, Prop 8 was a, was a an alteration of the California Constitution, so they couldn't say it violated the California Constitution, this amendment to the California Constitution. So they said it was a violation of the federal Constitution. Perry versus Schwarzenegger. But I read that decision very carefully. And I even presented it to a hostile audience at Loyola Marymount University in 2011. There were all sorts of activists on the other side that showed up. And I said, we're going to have a pleasant conversation. You're not going to call me names. I'm not going to call you names. Can we agree on that? They said, sure. I said, if you give me an hour, you will end up agreeing with me. (laughs) You have to give me an hour. 45 minutes later, They agreed with me. Wow. Only took 45 minutes. And the guy had it it helped because he had his iPad and he said, I have the decision on here. He had his tablet, whatever it was. And he said, I have the decision on here because I love that decision so much. I said, I'll show you where the fallacies are. Begging the question. He never defines the term marriage or he defines it incorrectly. Right. In a way that's circular and, and um, equivocation. And there's uh, the other fallacies too, like fallacy of faulty analogy with uh, mm-hmm. racial uh, restrictions on marriage. And anyway, um, he said, uh, you haven't convinced me on the definition of marriage, but you have convinced me that it is about the definition of marriage. And I said, okay, tell me what the definition is mm-hmm. and don't violate the, don't violate the same I mean, don't, don't have the same complaints about your definition that you do of mine. Sure. Because if you, as soon as you put these boundary conditions on any word, you can say it's discriminatory. I mean, I define apples this way that discriminates not against oranges, 
but between apples and oranges. And I said, yeah, so I'm not discriminating against anybody. I'm discriminating between being married and not married. Yes. (laughs) So I'd say you and your boyfriend are not married. You think you are, but you're not. The word itself is falling on hard times. Yeah. Anyway, we had a great time and he didn't take offense to what I was saying. I don't think he was just very interested in what I was saying. I said, I don't want to take any rights away from you, by the way. I mean, the way I would put it is if you had just asked differently, if you would have just said, Joe and I, whoever it is, we want to be able to visit each other in the hospital. Just the easiest way for you to do that is to call our arrangement marriage. And we don't know it's not the same thing, but can you just please uh, legislatively give us a break on this? And if they would approach it that way, instead of saying you're hateful and you hate us and you're a bad person, well, then we're going to become defensive and we're going to start looking very carefully at your argument because we know you're wrong about the hateful part so what else are you wrong about and they really listened to me and they they said yeah you're right we didn't approach that the right way so anyway i really do think that that most most people most young people as we're talking about gen z if the terms are set if the terms of, of of the discussion are framed in that way and if they know that we will respect their views regardless of where they're coming from. I really, my experience is that most of the time they rise to the challenge. They may not agree that they themselves are image bearers, but they will sense whether or not I'm treating them as one or not. That's good news. Speaking of Gen Z, if your listeners, some of your listeners may be parents of Gen Z or Gen Zers themselves, uh, this resource is brand new, No Be Live, a 360 approach to discipleship in a post-Christian era, uh, recently published in uh, October of 21, and uh, our good friend JP uh, did the, the foreword for this. It's an edited volume. It's all about a holistic discipleship model for Generation Z. Some of the contributors you'll recognize, uh, our good friend and colleague, Sean McDowell, does a fantastic chapter on sexuality for this generation. Uh, Our friend uh, and Biola professor, Kyle Strobel, does a phenomenal job with his chapter on spiritual formation. Both of of Uh, those guys have uh, PhDs. That's right. But but they also have famous dads. (laughs) They do. They they do. But they both do. (laughs) But they don't really, they don't seem to talk about it much. So they're their own guys and they've, yeah. they've done the hard work. They've done PhDs, both of them. That's cool. I see Kyle around. I see he, he hangs out at a coffee shop we go to uh, sometimes after Fantastic church. Fantastic guy. And I see him around. I don't know him very well. I don't think he knows me at all, but that's all right. So w- this is, uh, we'll link this on this episode. And we'll For those who like to listen, uh, it's available on uh, Audible uh, for, for those who would like to listen on their commute. Okay. Um, all, all how do people get a, get a hold of you to, for more information on what you do at Impact 360? Sure. Yeah. They can get in touch with me uh, at john, J-O-H-N dot Basie, B-A-S-I-E at impact360.org. And they can also find me on LinkedIn. Right now I'm not on Facebook, but LinkedIn would be the best place. If anyone purchases purchases the book, I don't get any royalties from that. All proceeds go to the work of Impact 360 Institute. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a joy. Thank you, Lucas. (laughs) I really enjoyed hanging out with you and just talking some shop, getting to know you better. Appreciate what you're doing. Great.